Hey, what's up, Rattlers? So, you know, I gotta say, I, I really wasn't going to do this video. There's been so many other YouTubers who have given their thoughts on the Spider-Ball Python, and I just wasn't gonna do it. I wasn't gonna add to it all. What more could actually be said about it? And then I had a conversation with a couple of people at a couple of expos here in the United States, and it really got me thinking about the way that people think about not only the Spider-Ball Python, but about the question of banning the Spider-Ball Python. So I had a hole in my schedule this week while I prepped for another adventure. So I figured, you know what, I'm gonna stick that camera on that tripod and I'm gonna share with you all my thoughts on the Spider-Ball Python. Yeah, I know, I'm like nine months late to the party, but anyway, here are my thoughts on the Spider-Ball Python. I'm Dave Kaufman and I tour the world to see how reptiles are living in the wild. And while I'm at it, checking out some of the most amazing facilities and reptile expos as well. It's all about learning, appreciation, and conservation. So come with me and join my reptile adventures. At Rainbow Mealworms, we grow all our insects 100% naturally so that you get the freshest, most lively feeders on the market. So for all your reptile food needs, place your order today at rainbowmealworms.net. So this whole controversy over the spider ball python, as I'm sure you guys know from watching other YouTubers' videos on the subject, started last year, maybe nine or ten months ago, when in the UK the IHS banned the sale of spider ball pythons uh, from the expos there in the UK. But at the same time, they also banned the Enigma leopard gecko and the jaguar carpet python. So the whole controversy over this issue was about the question, do we ban spider ball pythons because, in fact, they do have a neurological issue? And I have some thoughts on this, and as a matter of fact, I'll just start off by saying that when I first got into ball pythons, the spider ball python was my favorite favorite morph that there was. And I've always said that if you want to get known in the ball python world, it is a huge, huge market. And there are so many people breeding ball pythons that it's easy for, you know, beginners to kind of get lost in this sea of ball python breeders. And a lot of people have asked my advice on how they can make it in the ball python world. And my advice is always simple. Pick a gene that you really love and work with it and get known for working with that gene. Don't try to be the one that, you know, wants to produce every gene out there or work with every gene out there or want to become, you know, the breeder that does the world's first. That gets you temporary notoriety, but in the long run, you know, that is very short-lived notoriety. So I always say, if you want to make it in the ball python world, pick a gene and work with that gene and get known for working with that gene. And for me, when I first began, it was the spider ball python. I remember seeing that poster that Nerd put out, along came a spider and it had all the spider morphs on there. And I had that poster and I just stared at it all the time, just dreaming about, okay, I want to produce this spider morph. I want to produce that spider morph. And so I began to really early on when I began breeding ball pythons now over a decade ago, I began to really beef up the spider gene in my collection, and I wanted to be known for a breeder that is working with the spider gene and producing these really awesome combos that you can make with the spider gene. And as I began to do that, I began to notice, as I knew before I started breeding them, that babies were coming out of the egg and they were twisting, and they couldn't hold their bodies straight, they couldn't hold their heads up, they didn't know which direction was up. Unfortunately, yes, the spider gene does have a neurological issue, and that is so unfortunate because it is such an awesome morph. And you know, I remember, God, it must have been eight years ago, I wanted to produce what is still my favorite ball python morph out there. I wanted to produce a super pastel calico spider. And I remember the first year that I got those eggs and those eggs started pipping and I got a, you know, a bumblebee out of it. I got a calico bumblebee out of it. I got a calico normal spider out of it, uh, which were called colliders. And I just didn't hit that super pastel calico spider until the very last egg hatched 
And in fact, I did hit one super pastel calico spider in that clutch. And it was, to this day, one of the greatest moments in, you know, the past, again, over a decade that I've been breeding these snakes. But that guy had an issue. And I, I wasn't going to sell him to begin with because that was going to be one of my holdbacks. But she didn't make it very long. And it's because she was afflicted with that neurological issue. But, you know, as you're watching this and looking at the snake in my hand, I'm sure you're thinking, well, Dave, that's not a spider. No, this is an albino pied. And that leads me to my next point. All the racks behind me here, they don't have a single spider in them because I stopped breeding the spider ball python. And I moved over to my other first love, which is pides. And again, this is an albino uh, pied uh, who is an adult female, and she's going to be uh, bred to an orange dream enchi het pied this year. So I'm really excited about that. But, you know, the point to all of this is, is that I made a personal choice to stop breeding spider ball pythons, even though, again, spider ball pythons were my favorite morph, and they're what I wanted to be known for, you know, working with that gene. I wanted to be known as the spider guy, the spider ball python guy. And it was a very difficult decision for me to say, I don't want to keep breeding these because of that neurological issue. That was a personal decision that I had to make for myself and for my family behind me here. And it wasn't an easy one. I, 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 I wrestled with that for a number of years, but as I kept producing more and more spiders and seeing more and more neurological issues, you know, the question on whether or not I was going to continue to breed them became pretty evident. And I remember one year I produced caramel albinos, which are known for kinking. Uh, I produced caramel albino spiders and not one of the babies was right. Not only did they have kinking, but they also had neurological issues. Um, and it was, it was devastating. It was devastating to know that, you know, in my quest to produce more and more, um, kind of, you know, what I thought were pretty awesome morphs, but there were these issues with it that I had a moral and ethical problem, you know, bringing more of those snakes into the world when I knew about the issues that they were having. And so now my entire family in these racks behind me are all pied or pied combos or, you know, fill in the blank combos that are het pied or, you know, things that I want to incorporate into the pied gene because the pied gene was also my first love along with the spider. And the pie gene, as we all know, is a much stronger uh, gene than the spider is. So, and besides, you know, I, I gotta say, I was really disappointed when I saw the first spider pieds. I mean, that beautiful spider pattern, and we put it on a pied, and all we get are head markings. Man, talk about a jip. I was really disappointed with that morph. So, Anyway, again, what I'm saying is, is that it became a personal decision for me to stop breeding a gene that I so loved in the beginning. So not only was it about the neurological issue that spiders have that made me make the decision to quit, you know, breeding them, but I asked myself a very specific question. Does this neurological issue that spiders have, is it causing the snake pain? Is it causing them stress? And there's really no way to answer that question because all we can really do is read the snake's body language. And I gotta say, when I looked at the spider gene and, and the body language that these snakes were, you know, showing me, you know, rapid tongue flicks is the sign of a nervous snake. And, you know, I never really noticed that in the spiders. I never noticed them, you know, being restless in their enclosures, uh, which is a sign of stress. So, you know, the question on, you know, is there pain, is there stress in these animals because of their neurological issue? I don't know the answer to that, but I'm going to say no, simply because of, you know, what I've looked at in these snakes and the body language that they give off. And then, of course, talking with other breeders, you know, a lot of breeders still breed the spider ball python, and they still have spider ball pythons as pets, and they are reporting that the snakes do just fine, they eat you know, better than a lot of other morphs do. 
um, and they just do better overall than a lot of other morphs do. But it raises the question about, you know, the overall care of spider ball pythons. You know, let's face it, there's a lot of breeders out there who, you know, like me, think about these snakes as my family, and they want to make sure that these snakes have absolutely everything that they need to live long and happy and prosperous lives within our families. But let's face it, there's also a lot of other keepers out there that just don't care. They see these snakes as dollar signs. And so, you know, it comes down to the individual's care of these animals. And so when you see these clips in some of these videos where you're seeing the ball python, you know, in complete stress and complete disarray, you know, it, it, you gotta ask, how is that particular animal being kept? Is it being kept in the right conditions with the right heat and the right humidity? And if not, is that exacerbating uh, that already neurological issue that the spider has? So every time I watch something like that and I see an external clip of a spider ball python, you know, doing this or whatever, I always question, you know, how is that spider ball python being kept? You know, that neurological issue that spider ball pythons have you know, it's not like a black and white thing across the board. There are going to be some spider ball pythons out there that are perfectly fine, that have no head wobble whatsoever, that are just as, you know, calm and content as this albino pied in my hand right now. And then there's others that completely corkscrew all over the place, can't keep their head up, you know, the rapid tongue flicks. And another issue is that the spider ball python is kind of getting all the press over, you know, being a snake that has these neurological issues. Well, champagnes can have that neurological issue. Hidden gene womas can have that neurological issue. Um, but nobody's really talking about those other snakes. They're always, hi, how you doing, buddy? They're always talking about the spider ball python. So again, there's a few ball python morphs that do have these disorders that, you know, we really need to uh, include in the conversation when we're talking about the spider ball pythons. And going a step beyond that, you know, look at the cinnamons, look at the super cinnamons, which are called eight balls. You know, they have kind of a duckbill thing going on. Their faces are distorted. Um, there is kinking. You know, you got to ask yourself why you haven't seen a lot of, you know, panda pides out there. And it's because of that kinking. So it's another gene that, you know, is very common. But, you know, again, if we're going to talk about disorders in ball pythons, you know, you can't just shine that spotlight on the spider ball python. Um, and even the black pastel, which has kind of replaced the cinnamon, there's not as bad of kinking in those super forms, but I've seen a couple of super black pastels that do have that kinking. So my point is, is that it comes down to a personal decision. And it comes down to the fact that, especially here in the United States, nobody can tell you what you can and can't do. So again, it all comes down to you and your personal decision, your moral compass on whether or not you want to continue to work with the spider ball python knowing that there is factually an issue with that gene. It all comes down to you. And nobody, especially in this country, can tell you what to do. You know, who gets to decide that you can't do something. Who gets to decide that you can't breed the spider ball python or the champagnes or the hidden gene womas? Who gets to decide that? Nobody gets to decide that. So this whole issue, again, it comes right down to you and, you know, where your moral compass lies as far as, you know, do you want to breed a snake that has these known issues? Or are you going to do what I do and make a very difficult decision to say, I don't want this gene in my family any longer. And uh, that was, again, a very difficult decision to make. And I'm not saying that I'm taking the high ground here over anybody else that wants to work with spiders. I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying that it comes down to a personal decision. It comes down to a decision that you and I make for ourselves and for our reptile families. And that's the bottom line with it. But Anyway, I'm going to put her away real quick. Hang on. So I'm just going to reiterate this one more time because it's a very important point. Nobody, nobody can tell you 
what you should be doing with your ball pythons. Nobody should be able to tell you that you cannot breed the spider or the woma or the champagne or whatever because of these neurological issues. And on that matter, nobody can tell you not to breed the jaguars even though a super jaguar is known to be a lethal gene. And the Enigma leopard geckos, you know, again, if you're a leopard gecko breeder, nobody can tell you not to do that. It comes down to you and it comes down to your personal feelings about these snakes and whether or not well, you want to keep producing these animals knowing that there are going to be babies in that clutch that are just simply not going to be right. Nobody can take the moral high ground and say, hey, you can't do this. But here's another very important point, and I'm going to kind of go off on a tangent here, and this is the reason why I decided to make this video. The conversation that I had at, I think it was the Phoenix Expo, and then at Tinley, and then wherever I was, you know, a lot of people have come up to me and asked me why I have not yet made this video, and they ask me my opinion on the Spiderball Python, and I tell them exactly what I've just told you guys. And in these conversations, here in the United States, more than one of them has told me that they believe that the Spiderball Python should be completely banned that there should be a group of people, one of them actually asked me to head up this group of people, that goes to the government and demands that the government step in and issue an all-out ban on spider ball pythons. <sighs> My degree is in history, and in that, American history, and the way that our government was formed, what our forefathers in this country were thinking when they wrote the Constitution, when they wrote the Bill of Rights. What was behind those words? That's what I have studied, that's what I have my degree in. And the bottom line to what our forefathers here in the United States were thinking when they wrote that Constitution was very simple. The government should stay out of the lives of the people. Period. Here in this country, the government was set up so that you sink or swim by your own blood and sweat and tears, by your own talents, by your own abilities. Does it work that way in today's world? Absolutely not. But the original intent of the forefathers was to set up a government that does not interfere in people's lives, in people's freedom. That is why we have the Second Amendment. That is why we have the First Amendment. So the very idea that a group of people should go to the government and draft a law that bans the sale and the breeding of the spider ball python. I don't think that these individuals that came up to me and, and suggested this realize what a slippery slope that is and how short-sighted that is. You know, in the UK, in Canada, in Australia, well, we all know about Australia's reptile laws, but in other countries, I can't speak for them because I don't live in those countries. But here in the United States, where I do live, I can say that you never, ever go to the government and ask them to do anything. Again, it doesn't work that way in today's world because a lot of people go to the government and say, help me. And that started, you know, in the late 20s after the stock market crash, and it just kind of snowballed from there. The point that I'm making is that we have organizations called U.S. ARC that are busting their ass out there to protect your rights to keep these in your home. And the idea to go to the government that U.S. ARC is working with and sometimes fighting with for your rights and asking them, to ban a snake? I, my head just started melting like the end of, you know, Raiders of the Lost Ark. I just could not believe that this was being suggested. So I want you guys to comment below and let me know what your thoughts are on an all-out ban on the spider ball python here in the United States. Because I really want to know how many people out there think like these multiple individuals that came up to me at these expos have suggested. I think it's absolutely ludicrous and dangerous for us to do that. And to take away those personal freedoms, those freedoms for you and me to choose whether or not we want to work with the spider ball python or not is 
absolutely ludicrous. I just, I, I couldn't believe that American citizens were actually suggesting going to the government and asking them to intervene in something that we are fully capable of policing ourselves over. But again, comment below and let me know what you think about all of this, what you think about the idea of a full all-out ban on spider ball pythons in this country. So anyway, you know, I, I don't make a lot of these kinds of videos where I just sit here behind this, you know, table in front of these racks and kind of talk to you guys about, you know, issues that are happening in the industry. I, I also want to know if you want to see more of these types of videos from me as opposed to me running around jungles and catching really awesome reptiles, which I'm about to do. Uh, I think I have like two weeks before I head over to Thailand with Dan Maleri. That is going to be an awesome trip. You know, there's so many retics over there, uh, so many Tokay geckos, Asian water monitors. I'm going to do videos on them all. And I'm really looking forward to getting out in the field with Dan Maleri from DM Exotics, actually. But as you're watching this right now, I am at the Anaheim Super Show. It's no longer the Pomona Show. It's going to go probably back to the Pomona Show. But this time, right now, as you're watching this, I'm in Anaheim, California at the Super Show. So if you are watching this before you head to the show, come up and say hi. And uh, also hit that subscribe button. Leave those comments below. Hit that like button. And until the next reptile adventure, love the planet, feed your reptile obsession, and rattle on.